Hopefully we have a nice weekend, although I think the forecast is rain, but we'll see. Yeah, well, I don't want to rain on your parade, but... Uh. All right, um, we've got a fair amount of ground to cover, so I want to make sure I give enough time to get through it. Um, you guys have asked a lot of questions. I have to say, your class has asked me more questions than any other class I've taught, and I, uh, I really like that, I do, uh, but I also find it gets me behind, so I've got to keep pushing forward, but I really do enjoy the questions, so... Uh, thanks for being such a participatory class. Um, I talked a little bit last time about uh, sequence elements, and sequence elements are um, specific sequences that uh, have a function of some sort. Uh, the function they have with respect to transcription are that they are targets for binding by proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. So proteins, <coughs> you already know, can bind to DNA. You saw, for example, that RNA polymerase in prokaryotic cells recognized and bound to specific sequences. Those are sequence elements known as promoters. A minus 10 sequence element, a minus 35 sequence element. In eukaryotic cells, as I said, the, um, the uh, sequence elements uh, and the transcription process itself are much more complicated than they are in prokaryotic cells. Okay? Much more complicated we really only scratch the surface of transcription in eukaryotic cells. You can see on the screen that there are three different classes of promoters uh, that are uh, used in eukaryotic cells. So a promoter is this whole collection of all this, this stuff that's here. All right? So this is a promoter. Okay? You can see uh, up here. Here's, um, you can see labeled a promoter. Here's a promoter. In another sense, you can include some of these other boxes as well. What is a promoter and what is not a promoter is uh, really a matter of definition. Okay? But the promoter uh, is a control sequence. That's what a, a promoter is. Okay? You can see different elements, and they have different names. Um, and as I say, here's, here's a set of promoters for an RNA polymerase 1. Here's a set of promoters for an RNA polymerase 2. Here's a set of promoters for an RNA polymerase uh, 3. Um, so I won't go through those in, in, in detail. Uh, and if, in fact, I'm not expecting you're just going to memorize those because I don't think that there's any purpose in doing that. Uh, I'm also not going to talk about enhancers right now. I'll talk about those later when I talk about uh, gene expression. Okay? But enhancers are really unusual elements. That's the one thing I will say about them. They're very unusual in that they do affect the transcription of genes. And we find enhancers in variable places relative to the genes that they help enhance the transcription of. Variable places, meaning they can be thousands of base pairs away. They can be ahead of the gene. They can be behind the gene, meaning on the other side of the gene. They can even be in the middle of some genes. So enhancers are very odd elements affecting transcription. Okay? As I said, I'll talk more about those later. All right, well, what I want to do right now is say a little bit <clears throat> excuse me, about some specific uh, elements. In eukaryotic cells, there is a sequence called a TATA box. And it looks very much like the TATAAT box that we saw in prokaryotic cells. The sequence in eukaryotic cells that the consensus is T-A-T-A-A-A-A-A, like you see there. And the numbers after each letter is the percent of the time that that letter is the one that's used. Okay, so 87% of the time it's an A, I'm sorry, 82% of the time it's a T. 97% of the time it's an A. 93% of the time it's a T, et cetera. This sequence is not found at minus 10. It's found generally between minus 35 and about 100 of the start of a eukaryotic gene. Okay? So it also has a little bit of a variation in terms of where it appears. It's not something that's absolute. Not all eukaryotic genes have a Tata box. Eukaryotic genes that are made in large quantities, however, will always have a Tata box. All right? So not every eukaryotic gene has a Tata box, but most of them do, and ones that have a lot of expression will have a Tata box. Yes? Do they have an ATRS sequence? No. They, they won't necessarily have anything that looks like that. So eukaryotic promoters, in prokaryotes we can say, okay, here's a promoter. We can recognize what a promoter is or something that looks like that promoter. 
In eukaryotic cells, we don't always see that. We don't always see that. Okay, here <coughs> is, uh, are, are some more uh, sequence elements. The top one's called a cat box, okay? Because it has the sequence C-A-A-T. Down below, you see a GC box. Now you might say, well, why would you have a GC box, right? Because the Tata box function was to be able to pull the strands apart, right? Well, what this tells us is that the important thing isn't necessarily pulling the strands apart, but recognition. Recognition, right? So this can be useful for recognition purposes, but not necessarily for pulling the sequences apart. So when we think about eukaryotic cells, we have many proteins that are binding at the place where transcription is going to start. So having one that's, say, recognizing and giving it an anchor, a place to bind, is perfectly functional. Not everything has to be involved in pulling the strands apart. Okay, and cat boxes and GC boxes are also variable in uh, location ahead of the gene. It's, it wouldn't be uncommon to have control sequences, uh, sequence elements in the eukaryotic gene two to 300 base pairs ahead of the start site. In eukaryotic cells, we have, as I said earlier, a thousand times more DNA than we have in prokaryotic cells. We don't have a thousand times more genes, okay? We don't have a thousand times more genes. In a prokaryotic cell, we might have 3,000 genes. In your cells, you've got about 30,000 genes, okay? You've got about 30,000 distinct genes that are in your cells. Now, variations on that, mixing and matching of those and similar ones might bring that total up to 100,000, right? But those 100,000 are variations on a theme. The theme, the main genes that you have are about 30,000. So there's only about 10-fold more genes, but you've got 1,000-fold more DNA. Is it accounted for by the fact that the uh, genes themselves are that much bigger in eukaryotic cells? It's not, right? It means that there's a lot of DNA that we have that do not code for protein. Prokaryotic cells, there's very little of the DNA that doesn't code for protein, okay? Very little. The genes in a prokaryotic chromosome are very tightly packed. One gene, another gene, another gene, another gene. In eukaryotic cells, we have a gene, and that gene will actually be in pieces we'll talk about. Then we may go down uh, maybe 10,000 base pairs, and we'll have another gene. And then a gap of a couple thousand base pairs and another gene. So the genes in eukaryotic cells are spaced out relative to each other, way more so than they are in prokaryotic cells. Okay, um, enhancer sequences, as I said, I will talk about later. I've briefly mentioned that they, uh, don't, that they have up to several thousand, they can be up to several thousand base pairs uh, from a gene. They can be ahead of, middle of, etc. They can also be backwards or forwards, all right? So those things give us a little bit of clue in terms of what an enhancer uh, sequence actually is doing. The fact that it goes backwards and forwards tells us it isn't involved in orienting the transcription. It's not involved in orienting the transcription. Okay, and uh, the enhancer sequences are specific to specific cells. Now the sequences are there in all the cells, but the proteins that recognize those sequences are specific to specific cells. So for example, I will have in my skin cells a protein that will recognize an enhancer sequence that's present in all of my cells but my bone cells might not have that protein that recognizes that same sequence, okay? So, and I'll, as I said, I'll talk more about those later. Eukaryotic ribosomal RNAs are made by RNA polymerase one. The larger uh, sequences are made by RNA polymerase one. And these uh, occur, uh, they're synthesized in the form of pre-messenger RNAs, kind of like we saw in prokaryotic cells only, in this case, we only have ribosomal uh, RNA sequences on there. You can see what happens with these. There are sequences that get removed. They get processed in the way, so the yellow guys eventually disappear. They get chopped out by nucleases that cut out those sequences. And you can also see on here the places where modifications are made to those ribosomal RNAs. So, like we saw in transfer RNAs in prokaryotic cells, in eukaryotic cells, we see chemical modification of some of the ribosomal RNAs, okay? We also see chemical modification 
of the ribosomal transfer RNAs, just like we saw in the prokaryotic transfer RNAs. Okay? Those modifications, as I said, are not completely clear why they are made, but they are, in fact, made. Okay, uh, question. Oh, you're scratching your head. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, don't need to go through that. All right. Transfer RNAs are made by RNA polymerase 3, and they get processed. And the, some of the processing that we see is very much like the processing that we saw within the prokaryotic cells. Remember, in the prokaryotic cells, we had addition of a CCA at the 3' end, and there's a CCA being added to the 3' end of this eukaryotic uh, transfer RNA. This shows the um, um, sort of orientation of the transfer RNA. I think I've talked about that a little bit before, but um, I'll just mention it again because we're going to talk about it in translation uh, next week. And that is that the mature transfer RNA has three uh, main loops and a sort of a, 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 a little offshoot loop over here. These three loops, um, as you, if you look inside there, you'll see things like Ds. You'll see uh, methyls uh, where the little M's are located. You'll see there's a pseudouridine right there. This is called the pseudouridine loop because that's where that is located inside of there. There's a pseudouridine right there as well. And in the anticodon, um, this is a very important sequence for pairing with the codon in, in, a, in a messenger RNA during translation. So this anticodon right here is something we'll talk a lot about. Uh, next week uh, as we consider the phenomenon of translation. Now, there is processing that's going on of these. And when I say processing, uh, in this case, I'm talking about both the cleavage to remove the um, excess sequences, so these green and blue sequences that you see on the screen uh, get removed. And you also uh, see the addition of the CCA, as I noted before. Okay? So, there are some modifications that's happening uh, inside of all of these guys. You also see intron on here, and I think many of you know what introns are. Uh, introns are intervening sequences that are found uh, within um, uh, almost all eukaryotic RNAs, and these are removed during the phenomenon of processing. We'll talk about the removal of introns uh, in just a minute. But th those, those sequences don't end up in the final mature RNA. Yes? So the, the question is, are, are, are the, is the processing occurring in the nucleus? I think is your question. So the processing of RNAs is occurring in the nucleus. Yeah. Is that a question or is that you just, no, just stretching. Okay. I'm really sensitive to people raising their hands today for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe I'm too much coffee this morning or something. Okay. Eukaryotic messenger RNAs uh, are also processed. We don't see processing of messenger RNAs in, in prokaryotic cells almost at all. But we see a lot of processing of eukaryotic messenger RNAs, a lot. Okay? So keep that in mind as we're looking through here. I'll remind you that the eukaryotic messenger RNAs are made by RNA polymerase II. And they have several different reactions that they undergo. The first I'll describe to you is a, is a process called capping. Capping. So if we look at the 5' prime end of a eukaryotic messenger RNA, we will discover something interesting. It has an unusual structure on it that's placed on there during the processing. That structure is called a cap. And what that cap is, is a modified guanosine Let's put, this is guanine up here. It's a modified guanosine that has been methylated. So there's a methylated uh, guy right up here. And it's been linked to what was the first base of the original messenger RNA in a very unusual linkage. It's linked 5' prime to 5'. Prime. A 5' prime to 5' prime linkage of a modified guanine to what was the very first base that the the uh, RNA polymerase put into the messenger RNA. Now, why does this modification happen? What this modification does is really two big things. One is it flags the cell and says, hey, I'm a messenger RNA. Okay? Actually, I should say three big things. Okay? One is it flags and says, that this, I'm a messenger RNA. Second, as we will see, this cap plays a role in translation. 
It occurs in the trans it plays a role in the translation of eukaryotic messenger RNA. It's not present in prokaryotic, so it's obviously not needed for prokaryotic uh, translation. The third thing that this cap does is it provides protection against nucleases. I've already told you that there are nucleases that are abundant inside of cells. And in particular, what this cap does is it protects against exonucleases. An exonuclease starts at the end of a nucleic acid and starts chewing inwards. When the exonuclease binds to this guy, it, can, it cannot cut that 5' prime to 5' prime bond, which is one of the reasons why it has an unusual bond. Okay? So the nuclease can't touch that guy right there. It absolutely keeps the 5' prime end from being degraded. Okay? Yes, sir? Can an exonuclease start at the 3' prime end and work inwards? And you're, you're, you're ahead as always. And the answer is yes, it can. And we will see that, in fact, that plays a role in determining how long messenger RNAs are around. So good question. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in just a second. OK. Now, another modification that occurs to eukaryotic messenger RNAs occurs at the 3' prime end. So we're modifying both the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end. But at the 3' prime end, we're not putting any unusual bonds like we did at the 5' prime end. Instead, we put a long string of A's. A, OK? It's called a poly A tail at the 3' prime end. Uh -huh. The way it occurs is the uh, RNA polymerase will copy a, uh, a messenger RNA. And by the way, you can see the cap goes on here pretty quickly. This, this uh, RNA polymerase is still copying the DNA when the cap has already been placed on there. So the cap goes on pretty quickly. All right? The RNA polymerase copies the DNA, and it passes through a sequence that reads AAUAAA. That sequence, AAUAAA, tells the cell, this is the place near here to start putting the poly A's. So there's a protein that will bind to the AAUAAA, and it will cut at some point ahead of that. And a special polymerase called poly A polymerase will come and start putting a long string of A's at the 3' prime end. Why in the world does it do that? Cells sometimes do things that don't make sense. In this case, it actually makes some sense, all right? But it seems kind of wasteful. What the A's provide, the cell will put on 2 to 300. A's at the end of, a, of, a, of a, a, a messenger RNA. It only goes on messenger RNAs. So there's another way of flagging messenger RNAs. It looks like what the A's do is they help determine the lifetime of a messenger RNA. The lifetime. The longer the A sequence, the longer the messenger RNA can be found in the cell. Why? Well. Just as he asked here just a minute ago, a nuclease can come onto this and attach and start chewing inwards. And when it starts chewing inwards, it's kind of like a telomere. It chews inwards for a ways, it falls off. The longer the number of A's there are, the longer this sequence will be laying around because it takes more and more and more nucleases to completely chop it off and start getting up into here into the meat of the messenger RNA and breaking it down. So the poly A's help to determine how long a messenger RNA is stable inside of a cell. Yes? Can transcription occur without the poly A tail? Can transcription occur without the poly A tail? There are some genes that, that are made without a poly A tail, yes. So uh, we're going to talk more about stability of messenger RNAs as a way of controlling gene expression later. Okay? So there are many factors that determine how much of a given protein is actually made. How much RNA is made is one that we've talked about. How efficient translation occurs is another.
How splicing occurs is another that I'll talk about. How much the RNA is degraded is another. And there are even yet additional factors that affect things in terms of the binding of proteins to the messenger RNA. So there's a lot of factors that help cells to control how much of a given protein is actually made. Yes? Are proteins that are made in abundance, do they have longer, do they have longer poly A tails? I would like to say yes, but the answer is no. Because all these other factors I just described to you help contribute to the overall amount of protein that's there. Yep. OK. Um, somebody, a couple of people have asked me about microRNAs and silencing RNAs, so I wanted to say a little bit about them. Uh, these are tiny RNAs that are made inside of cells. They're typically made by RNA polymerase 2 or RNA polymerase 3. And these guys are little bitty guys, all right? Under 100 nucleotides. They might be under 50 nucleotides. And they are typically made in the way that you see here. So here is a complete microRNA. Okay, what's a microRNA? What's a silencing RNA? Well, they actually are similar, and I'm only going to show you this one for the microRNAs up here. Silencing RNAs are very similar uh, to them in function and how they work. They just have a different name. Okay? They're synthesized in, uh, by one of these uh, polymerases, and these guys have self-complementary regions, kind of like you've seen before. Remember how we had the jack lifting up the end of the RNA polymerase? Well, this is a self-complementary sequence. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, it is the precursor to what becomes a microRNA. This precursor is cleaved by some enzymes to make this guy here that looks a little bit cleaner, as it were. It doesn't have tails hanging off of it like it does there. Okay? And this pre microRNA is then cleaved and clipped down to something that looks like this double stranded RNA here. You see no loop. You see nothing else, maybe a little bit of base is hanging off of each end. Okay? And then this double-stranded RNA is pulled apart by some proteins. It's pulled apart. Now, what's the process of, why, why is all this stuff going on? All this is going on because it turns out that one of these strands that was made in the original RNA, one of these strands, like you can see here, where it says the mature microRNA, one of these strands is complementary to some messenger RNAs. Complementary to some messenger RNAs. Okay? Now, if I am a cell and I'm making a messenger RNA and there's a complementary sequence to it, that complementary sequence can bind to that messenger RNA. Right? And they do. They interact, they bind. Okay? That binding screws up the translation of that messenger RNA. It can be a target for degrading, destroying the messenger RNA, in which case no protein will be made. It can also stop the translation of that messenger RNA, in which case no protein will be made. Now, I said, not everything a cell does is logical. The cell has gone to all the trouble of making that messenger RNA. And now it's making another RNA that's used to stop translation. What the heck? Why would a cell do that? Why would a cell waste energy like that? Well, there's a very simple answer to it. This turns out to be a defense mechanism for cells. Okay. It's a defense mechanism. Cells didn't evolve the system to control their own genes. They evolved the system to knock out viral genes that were coming in. So a virus invades a cell. A virus makes its own messenger RNAs. And those messenger RNAs get translated to the detriment of the cell. If the cell has a way of stopping translation of those, Bingo, it's got a defense mechanism. 
That defense mechanism was likely invoked to stop viral RNAs from being made. The cell, over time, began to see the benefits of, doing, of, of controlling gene expression as well. There may be upwards of 1,000 genes in our cells that are controlled partly by this mechanism. So here's yet another way that cells can control how much of a given protein is made. Well, it turns out this battle goes both ways. Because some viruses, particularly in plants, can make their own microRNAs that target cellular genes. Okay? So everything in biology is a continual warfare. It's a continual warfare. Question? Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. Why make microRNAs instead of making a full strand to combat that? I can only speculate, but my speculation is, number one, making a full uh, RNA might be dangerous for the cell. How would it be dangerous for the cell? Well, it would mean that if we looked at the other strand, it would be a completely functional gene that would be a viral gene. That if it accidentally put a promoter in front of it, would now be making a very detrimental gene for itself. So that's one. The second speculation I have is that um, it's more efficient to do it this way. You only have to make a very short RNA to control a gene instead of a very long one. But again, I, I, that's only speculation on my part. You have a question? How did the cell come up with this, this DNA? It got selected for. It got selected for. Okay? So when we look over evolutionary time, we will see mutation, and we will see beneficial mutations that will um, be kept in the genome over time. So mutations that gave defense against viral genes initially were selected for, okay? and then they were kept because they gave protection for cells that had those compared to cells that didn't have those. Make sense? Yes, sir? Yeah, why does it go through all this process? Can't tell you. Can't tell you. Yes? Good question. So, in other words, I, I think if I understand the question, how, how does it keep this functional, basically, is what you're saying, right? So, because cells have nucleases, and nucleases break things down. And, yeah, this will get broken down over time. Um, so, one of the defenses is the cell does make a fair amount of this, okay? It does make a fair amount. When people first started studying uh, RNAs inside of cells, they found all these little tiny RNAs. I think I've told this story before. All these little tiny RNAs. And they just assumed that they were broken pieces of things that were, they had done in the isolation process, that they were just junk. And it turned out they weren't. There's a lot of them. If you ever do an RNA prep in a cell and you look down at the bottom at the little tiny stuff, there's a ton of little bitty guys that's there. So um, there is an awful lot of it that's made. Yes, sir? So for example, you have an example about the virus. Yes. RNA. How does the cell know okay, this is viral RNA, so let's make a bunch of those complementary so to block it? How does the cell know I'm going to block viral RNA? It didn't. Cells don't have a brain, all right? But cells have a selective advantage if they are working against a virus, and other cells don't have that. So cells that had those that knocked out viruses survived, and those that didn't knock out those viruses didn't have as much of a chance of surviving. So they produce those microRNA just randomly until someone will actually measure All of evolution starts randomly. But, this is but selection different. makes it have a direction, yes. and this is a selection. Yes? Well, could partially degraded RNA have the same purpose? It could, um, but it would have to be stable. I, I didn't mention it, but we actually have a protein helping to stabilize this thing. It would have to be stable uh, long enough to um, uh, have its, its function. It would also have to um, um, uh, have some advantage to, to have this certain piece kept. 
nuclease are going to be just chewing through things. And you can see this is a very specific process to keep a very specific piece of that. OK, just a couple questions, and I've got to move on. Yeah? Yeah. So are they still involved in protecting cells from viruses? They can be, uh, particularly in plants. This is studied very well in plants, and there's some very good evidence that there's a continual warfare between the viruses and the plant cell, and it goes back and forth. So plants very much use this as a defense mechanism. Yes? Uh, for example, there is new flu appears, which is viral, mm -hmm. and we people, we sequence the uh, viral genome. So we know the sequence. How can we may use this to make cells specifically made those ones in this Okay, so everybody would love to use this to do things, right? But again, when we think of using this to do something, we've always got to think about transforming genomes. We've got to change genomes in order to make that happen. This is a much more involved process. Currently, these things are used as laboratory tools to study processes. Okay, how effective they may be for medicinal purposes, and there are some medicinal things that actually are being done, not in human beings, but in plants, for example, all right? that these things are being studied as ways of uh, knocking out viral genes or knocking out undesirable genes uh, very commonly. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. As far as I know, they're pretty much made in a fixed quantity. So they're just pretty much continually made. Okay. Um, Related to this topic is, is a, a sort of unusual process called RNA editing, okay? RNA editing. Now, I've been showing you how RNAs are being processed and so forth. This is an unusual uh, uh, process that I want to show you here, okay? There's a protein called ApoB100, and it's related to a protein called ApoB48. These proteins are found in either LDLs or in HDLs. And you'll notice that the protein, the B100, found in uh, LDLs has a sequence that's not found in the HDLs. OK? Anybody with me? Well, so the ApoB100 is found in LDLs. It has a sequence that's not found in ApoB48, which is found in HDLs. The blue part's the same in the two. Turns out these guys are both made from the same messenger RNA. All right? They're made from the same messenger RNA. If we look in the, um, what, if we look at the, the original messenger RNA that's made, okay, it is made with a codon in the middle that's a CAA. If that CAA remains there, when it's translated, we get a full length protein. To a limited extent in liver, there's an enzyme that, will, that is made that will specifically deaminate this specific C inside of this messenger RNA. How unusual is that? A specific enzyme that specifically knocks, uh, t takes off the, the amine group off of the C in this CAA in this messenger RNA. When it does that, it converts the C into a U. And the U is a stop codon, meaning that translation stops at that point. It's through this mechanism that cells can make, use one messenger RNA to make two different proteins. Ones that translate the edited messenger RNA will make this. Cells that translate the unedited messenger RNA will make this. So there's many ways cells have, and we'll talk about some with respect to splicing in just a minute. There's many ways that cells have of making different proteins from the very same sequence. That's how we can have genes for 30,000 proteins inside of us, but we can make over 100,000 proteins because we're mixing and matching sequences. OK. Well, the mixing and matching becomes very uh, apparent when we talk about the phenomenon known as splicing. Splicing is something that we find in eukaryotic cells, but not in prokaryotic cells. There are, to my knowledge, only two exceptions to that rule. There are two genes that I'm aware of in prokaryotic cells that get spliced, and they have an, a very unusual mechanism of getting spliced. So we say, essentially, that splicing does not occur 
in prokaryotic cells. It occurs in eukaryotic cells very, very commonly. Most genes in eukaryotic cells are spliced. Okay? What does splicing mean? Well, if we look at, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to describe this for messenger RNAs, but the same thing happens for ribosomal RNAs and for transfer RNAs. If I look at a messenger RNA, and I look at the sequence inside of the DNA, I discover that there are sequences in the DNA for a gene that never make it into the final messenger RNA. And some of those sequences are in the middle of the gene. So it's not like they're just clipping off things off of the end. They're in the middle. Well, the sequences in the middle have a name. They're called introns. The sequences that make it, and, and the introns get clipped out. They get removed during the splicing process. We do not see the introns in the final mature messenger RNA. And again, the final mature ribosomal RNA, the final mature transfer RNA. We don't see the intron sequences. They've been removed. The sequences that we see in the final RNAs are the th sequences we call exons. So some process has to remove the intron, and that process is called splicing. Now splicing is a little bit of a mystery, because we would expect that there would be some very specific signals that would tell us, OK, this is an intron, remove this. This is an exon, keep this. But what we discover is that there's not a lot of sequence information. There's a little bit. If we look at the 5 prime end of the intron, there is always a sequence GU. The other sequences there appear to some extent, but not always. The only one that appears always is GU. If we look at the 3 prime end of the intron, we always see the sequence AG. Now GU appears a lot, and AG appears a lot. But not every GU is a splice site, and not every AG is a splice site. That's part of the mystery. If we look at an intron, we will also almost always see a sequence that is um, located about 30 nucleotides away. So it's about 30 nucleotides away from the 3 prime end of the intron. That's very pyrimidine rich very pyrimidine rich, and it has an A within that very pyrimidine rich region. As I will show you that A plays a role in the removal of the intron. Okay, so there's the, there's the setup that we've got. That's the sequence uh, layout. Now let's look at what happens in the removal of the intron. Okay. This is a terrible figure, but it's the only one I have. All right, here is exon number one. You saw it on the left in the previous slide. Here's exon number two. You saw it on the right in the previous slide. And the sequence in the middle is the intron. OK, you oriented there? The five prime end of the intron is on the left. The three prime end of the intron is on the right. There's the GU. There's the AG. And here's that pyrimidine rich sequence with an A inside of it. Okay? What happens in the process of splicing? I'm going to show you some proteins that help this to happen. I just want you to look at the process for the moment. What happens during the process of splicing is that the proteins that form a complex here on this uh, messenger RNA place this A in close proximity to the phosphate after that G. Okay. There's a nucleophilic attack, and the phosphate becomes linked to the, the G below there. Okay. It doesn't have to be a G. It can actually be a different nucleotide, but usually it's a G. All right. That frees the, the, the end, and that is... 
That's mislabeled. Huh. That should be 5 prime. Let's see. No, I, I, I take it back. I take it back. This, that's why I don't like this figure. This has been flipped upside down. So the 3 prime there is the 3 prime over here. There's the AG that you saw. Okay? All right. Now, this sequence, so we take it and we flip it, so we bring this bottom end up here. That's, that's what we see. Okay? This sequence is now brought into close proximity to the phosphate of the next exon. All right? So now this part is brought up here, and this 3 prime attacks that, breaking the bond there, so that the intron is actually removed. So we're just basically making a cut here and a joining of the blue to the green. That's what we see right here. So we've made two cuts. We've made one ligation. Actually, we've made two ligations because we've made a ligation here as well. All right. We're left with two exons that are joined together, and we're left with an intron that has what we call a lariat structure. This lariat structure has an unusual structure. It, looks, it does look like a lariat. And it has a bond in it that we don't see anywhere else in biology. Remember the bond I told you about at the cap of the messenger RNAs? It was a 5 prime to 5 prime bond. This bond in the lariat is a 5 prime to 2 prime bond. Okay. This intron, the question is what happens to the intron? The intron is just eventually degraded. In a few rare cases, the intron in this lariat structure actually has coding, and it gets translated. In some cases, it actually gets translated. Okay? But those are very rare. For the most part, the, le the intron itself is completely degraded. Okay. Can the intron become a microRNA? I don't believe so, because the microRNAs are set up with a system of processing them that gets them to the final product. I don't think that would work for this. I can't tell you definitively, again, but I, I don't think it will. Yeah? Why does it have a 5 prime and a 2 prime bond? Well, remember that the 3 prime is linked to the phosphate. So the only hydroxyl that's open is the 2 prime. That's why. So it turns out that the phosphate, I'm sorry, that the, the, this, this ribose that's here has a 3 prime bond here and it has a 2 prime bond there. So that, that ribose actually has two different things attached to it. Okay, well let's look at the proteins that are involved in, well there's the, there's, there's the this is showing you the, the uh, 2 prime, 5 prime to 2 prime linkage. There's the 5 prime end, there's the 2 prime end, there's the rest of the RNA chain going over there. Okay. Well, it turns out splicing occurs in a complex inside of cells known as a spliceosome. A spliceosome. A spliceosome contains a complex of proteins and of small nuclear RNAs. So small nuclear RNAs are called SNRNAs. So the spliceosome has a complex of proteins and small nuclear RNAs. The complex of proteins and small nuclear RNAs are called SNRNP, small nuclear ribonucleoparticles. Okay, ribonucleoparticles. People refer to them as SNRPs. Okay, it's not quite right, but that's what they refer to them, SNRPs. All right. This complex, and you can see that there are several proteins that's there. They have various names, U1, U6, U4, U2, U5, etc. All right. And these guys together with the SNRNAs that have the same names, by the way. So a U1 hold, a U1 protein holds a U1 SNRNA. A U4 hold, a U4 protein holds a U4 SNRNA. Okay? This complex of proteins and RNAs binds to a messenger RNA or a ribosomal RNA or a transfer RNA that has introns. Okay? When it binds, 
it makes a structure that looks kind of like this. Now, I'm just showing you this. Don't worry about getting your head around all the stuff that's here. It's not a big deal, all right? Here's our intron, okay? Here's uh, that pyrimidine-rich sequence, okay? U, C, U, and there's actually more around there as well, all right? We see that one of the small nuclear RNAs, which is carried by this ribos this, um, um, uh, the SNRP, one of the SNRNAs is complementary to that region that's pyrimidine rich. It forms base pairs. And really coolly, it forms base pairs such that one of those, the A, that was the target A that I told you about, bulges out. That bulging out of that now is a flag that this is the guy that's got to go down here and make the nucleophilic attack. So what we see in here, there are things, for example, the U6 and so forth, it's helping to hold the U2 in place, the U2 is binding this, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, as I said, don't worry about getting your head around the orientation or any of this sort of stuff, okay? Because that's not the, the important point that's here. The important point is that the spliceosome is recognizing a sequence in the intron and starting that chemical process that I described to you last time, or on the, on the last slide. Okay. Here are the, um, uh, the SNRP components, all right? There's a component U1, U2, U5, U4. Here's the small nuclear RNAs that they each contain. And there's the functions, none of which I'm going to expect you to memorize. Okay. Let's see. What do I want to say? I think we probably should finish with a song. Okay. I have a, I unfortunately don't have any songs about splicing, and I was hopeful that the weather was going to be nice. So I brought a song that I thought was relevant to what would be nice weather. It may not be nice weather. It's called, oh, oh darn it. It's a fun one to sing. It's called. At the coast, Oregon's fine all the year. All right? It's to the tune of it's the most wonderful time of the year. And? A glistening plus bird softly whistling and great local beers at the coast. Oregon's fine.